Well, hello, welcome back. In two of his articles, Professor Moriarty has cited the Cambridge Handbook of Intelligence to support his argument in relation to sexual dimorphism and the thorny issue of cognition. Now, this quotation highlights improvements in SAT scores. So in this video, we will be taking a comprehensive overview of education and gender. The common perception is that girls are disadvantaged or even discriminated against in education. A lot of money, primarily from the public purse, is spent on schemes designed to improve the academic achievement of girls, to bolster their confidence and improve their perception of worth. The curriculum has been changed to better suit learning preferences of female students. Examination questions amended to better match female cognitive preferences. But does this perception reflect reality? And is the professor justified in using this single issue to justify his position in relation to cognition? Well, let's take a look at the facts and figures. The first thing I'd like to look at is a quotation that the professor uses in two articles. The first article that it appeared in was when atheists ape creationists, fallacies and anti-feminism, and the second time the professor used a quotation, it was in the natural order of things. Now the quotation itself is lifted from the Cambridge Handbook of Intelligence. Uh, it's page 267, and it seems to be one of his favourite quotations. But the interesting thing is if we compare the two quotations from the original article in which it first appeared, and the second article in which it's used, there's an interesting omission. And if we compare the quotations side by side, we can see that a line has been dropped. The first line which says there are intellectual areas in which females on average excel and males on average excel. Now, I'm sure there's a very good reason why the professor decided to omit this particular sentence. Maybe it was because of brevity bearing in mind the total length of the second article. I don't think brevity is uh, a particular interest of the uh, professor. So it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it, why he decided to drop that particular sentence. An uncharitable interpretation may be that such sentences don't help with the, the narrative too much. Anyway, I thought that was uh, an interesting observation to make. Now we'll move on to the comparison between the performance of girls and boys in primary school. We work from primary into secondary to uh, A-level results. Now, data I'm going to use will come from several sources. And just to clarify, New Zealand, Australia and the UK are very similar in educational performance. The performance in primary, secondary and higher education between the UK and the United States are comparable, but as you would expect, they're not identical. There are slight variations between the, the systems involved, but it, it's a minor difference. It's a percentage point difference. Well, let's have a look at some facts and figures then. The first graph I'd like to look at is national standards by gender. It's used one to eight, so that's primary education. And I'd like us to have a look at the differentials in reading and writing outcomes between boys and girls. Now there's a slight female advantage in maths, but the differential in reading and writing is quite marked. There's quite a large difference in outcome in reading and writing between the genders. And this differential in reading and writing outcome is not to the advantage of boys. Well that's quite interesting, isn't it? There's quite a large differential in learning outcomes between girls and boys in primary education in reading and writing. In order to get some insight into this differential, we'll look at a report produced by the All Parliamentary Literacy Commission Group. The report was compiled by the National Literacy Trust. I think it will be useful to review some of the key findings contained within this Reading Commission report. The first thing I'd like to highlight in this report is paragraph 2.1. Boys' reading is a top concern for many schools. Now, the line I've highlighted in this paragraph is 76% of respondents said that boys in their school did not do as well in reading as girls. 76% is a remarkably high percentage. In evidence to the Commission, Emily Tudor, Deputy Head Teacher at St. Paul's Academy 
in Greenwich described the challenge her school had faced. Ten years ago, in a school made up predominantly of boys, the Year 11 Lower Ability exam took place in a separate room to the Higher Ability. It was a painful scene. There were the empty seats of boys who did not bother to turn up. Then there was that moment when they would start to put their pens down, 25 minutes, into a two-hour exam. So, 76%. Imagine what would happen if we flipped that round and 76% of girls had problems with basic literacy. Can you imagine the outcry? There'd be questions asked in Parliament. There'd be marches, petitions. But because it's boys that are falling behind, society is silent on the matter. The next report I'd like to highlight is Gender and Education. Now this is produced by the Department of Education and Skills and I'd like us to consider some of the key points that are made within this report. The key points in this report that are relevant to this discussion are the points made in reference to English and Maths and the point made in relation to science. English and maths first. The gender gap in English in favour of girls has been wide and persistent over six decades of exam records, an average of 12 percentage points and a range of 6 to 18 percentage points. Now this differential has been persistent for 60 years. And the differential between girls and boys in reading and writing skills has been much larger than the differential between girls and boys in mathematical skills. The differential is quite noticeable in literacy and less so in mathematics where there's been a marginal or 4% differential traditionally. This differential obviously has been closed. I mean girls now have an advantage in mathematics. So over three key areas, maths, writing and reading, girls now have an advantage in relation to mathematics, then, the report says the following. In contrast, the narrower gender gap in maths has shifted from a male advantage, an average of 4 percentage points and a range of 1 to 8 percentage points, between 1951 and 1991, with a peak between 1978 and mid-1980s, to a slim female advantage from 1997 to the present and this advantage is equivalent to one or two percentage points. We turn now to what the report has to tell us about the situation in science, and the report says the following. The gender gap has always been relatively small in the sciences. Currently, girls are two to three percentage points ahead of boys in double award science. Few students now take the separate sciences, but of those that do, boys do one percentage point better than girls in physics and biology. Boys and girls perform the same in chemistry, making the separate su sciences the only subject where there isn't a female advantage. So it seems to me this presents a completely different picture to that painted by the feminist narrative. The reality of the matter is that boys are disadvantaged in relation to girls across a wide range of subjects, from reading, writing, mathematics, and the sciences. There is a consistent and large differential between the performances of boys and girls across the board. Now this is an entirely different picture to that presented by the average feminist. Now the final part of the report I'd like to highlight is in relation to the thorny subject of cognitive differences between the genders and in 10.2 the report finds the following. Research shows small or negligible overall gender differences on IQ tests and tests of reasoning. The report states that girls do better on verbal reasoning tests. Boys show greater variability on their test scores i.e. there are more boys in both the extreme low and the extreme high ranges of scores. Now this is consistent with what we know in relation to sexual dimorphism, that there's a wider range of IQ within the male population, so that's consistent uh, with the science. Relatively small gender differences in verbal reasoning 
does not seem to predict the large gender differences found in English and other humanity subjects in the national curriculum assessments. So this final point is quite important because what the report authors are stating is that although there's a difference in cognition between the genders, this relatively small percentage difference cannot explain the large variation between the genders in English and the other humanity subjects. Cognitive differences cannot explain the advantage that girls enjoy in the humanities and English subjects within the system. The next graph I'd like to look at is Key Stage 2. Now these children are 11 years old and every subject, English, reading, writing and science, shows an advantage to girls at this point and the only subject where boys have a marginal advantage of one percentage point is in mathematics. The next graph is the performance of boys and girls over time. Now this is the GCSE results and it tracks the results from 1962 to 2006 and you can see that from 1986 the differential has increased over time and this is a consistent difference. Now in 1986 the examination system changed and we went from the old general certificate of education to the new GCSEs and there were quite a few changes in the curriculum and these changes actually favoured girls over boys and the result is that girls outperform boys consistently and over quite some time. The next graph is particularly interesting because it vividly displays the fact that if you have a son attending school he will be disadvantaged in relation to his female contemporaries. And it doesn't matter which class you come from, you could be lower class or you could have high professional status. It doesn't make any difference, your son will be at a disadvantage within the education system. And it's not a marginal disadvantage, this is 12, 10, 11 percentage points. We've taken a fairly comprehensive look at primary and secondary education. And in the final graphic, I'd like us to look what happens post-secondary. This graph represents the percentage of bachelor's degree by major and what we're looking at in this graph is the percentage of degrees by gender and we're looking at males. What I'd like us to look at in this graph are the outliers, that is the fields which are dominated by one sex. The field most dominated by male graduates, which comes as no surprise to anyone, is engineering which is at the top of the graph. So you can see that from 1970 to 2010, the representation of males in engineering has slightly decreased over time, but it's still at 82, 83%. But there are also fields which are dominated by female graduates, and these are represented at the bottom of the graph. So you have health professionals, public administration, education, and psychology, all dominated by female graduates. Now the point I'd like to make in relation to this grouping at the bottom of the graph is that there are more degrees awarded for these subjects than for engineering and computer science. So if you was to look at the total amount of degrees awarded, the cluster at the bottom of the graph represents more degrees than the top of the graph. So you have more female graduates than male graduates. If we look at the physical we look at the physical we find that from 1970 to 2010 there's been a gradual decline in male graduates so we've got a 60-40 ratio in 2010 in the physical sciences in maths and statistics 50-60% in biology you have a gradual decrease from 1970 to 2010. In 1970 it was about 71% and 2010 it's just above 40%, 41-42%. To complete the graph we plot computer science and that seems to be doing its own thing over time uh, but in 2010 it was comparable to engineering in relation to the 
gender balance. In conclusion then, if in casual conversation you were to mention that inequality in education was wrong and something had to be done about it, most listeners would assume you were about to discuss how girls were disadvantaged. This is the received wisdom, the common perception that girls are disadvantaged or even discriminated against in education. The harsh reality is that they benefit greatly from an advantage in all core subjects. In reading and writing, the percentage difference in favour of girls can be 12 percentage points. In general, the differential ranges from 8 to 12 percentage points. And this disparity has been consistent in some subjects for over six decades. Girls have also gained an advantage in maths due to changes in the curriculum and the examination system. This gender disparity cannot be considered marginal, nor is it dependent on the professional class of the parents. If you have a son, he will be significantly disadvantaged within our education system simply because of gender. The gender gap in general science has always been historically marginal, and today girls have gained the advantage. This leaves the separate science subjects the only subjects where there is no female advantage. The cognitive advantage that girls have in verbal reasoning do not explain the gender differences found in English and other humanity subjects. Just imagine the public outcry, the angry parliamentary questions put the ministers, if the situation was that girls were disadvantaged in 9 out of the 10 core subjects in schools, and that 76% of schools reported that girls were significantly underachieving in reading and writing, what do you think the reaction would be? But because it is boys, indifference and complacency prevails. So finally, is Professor Moriarty correct? Well yes, girls now have a slight advantage in maths over boys. But he presents a rather parochial view of education. He paints with a very simplistic brush. The average attainment for girls in maths is no better than that of boys. But the question one should be asking is, at what cost is this achievement purchased? Also, it is not true that this improvement in average maths score is reflected at the extreme ends of the SAT test. At the highest end, males still consistently outperform their female competitors. Thank you for listening.